Hello, my name is Ken Small and I'm with SSA Architecture in Las Vegas, Nevada. Since we're among the architects that come up on the first or second page when you're uh, Googling restaurant architects in the Las Vegas area, we get quite a few calls on whatever the most recent so-called hot topic is for restaurant developers or people that own restaurants and so I've um, decided to do a video on uh, outdoor eating areas and so obviously with the uh, last two years everybody wearing masks and lockdowns and all those kind of things uh, the eating outdoors has become more popular in Las Vegas although it does get beastly hot over 125 degrees sometimes it's still a more moderate temperature than eating out in the snow and ice in Montana so it's a a moderate climate for eating outdoors by some standards so um, this has been pretty popular and um, people are asking about uh, how do we do it what do we do can we just tell the landlord can we put some tables outside and so I'm going to talk about that a little bit um, this has been kind of a moving target for the local um, building departments and planning and zoning departments so from when this is posted to when you do it or if you're in different jurisdictions things may be a little bit different so this is general information um, I do practice in Arizona and California I'm licensed in Texas other places and um, so in other places uh, it's possible that if you have a restaurant and you decide you want outdoor eating you just set some tables outdoors and away you go that is not the case in um, the Las Vegas area so um, some of the smaller towns around uh, might be different but if you're in the main developed area of um, Clark County then basically it's um, the way I'm explaining now which is that um, to uh, have outdoor eating there are basically um, two steps to the process now first of all let me say if you're in some uh, center that's a uh, retail center it's conceivable that in some of the centers that are designed to look like uh, old-fashioned downtown I don't want to use the names of the projects but uh, you know which ones they are that um, there has been a pre-approval process for um, the development to allow outdoor eating and you might be okay without having to go through any of these processes but don't believe the leasing agent go check it out and make sure that that's really the case if you're in a typical shopping center then I often have um, new customers come in and tell me well they found out that outdoor eating is allowed in this zoning and that also does not mean that you're allowed to have outdoor eating uh, in this location so um, it's a two-step process let's talk about the two steps the first one is um, the entitlement process and we have another video on entitlements which I'll link to when this is over and how all that works but the basics are that um, you go through a process of submitting to the planning and zoning people and getting approval and typically uh, that entails showing um, how many tables will be there uh, anything that might be built um, a lot of this can be done just using um, let us say uh, flower boxes or planter boxes to segregate an area where you don't want people to walk through that aren't your customers or uh, setting up a fence that isn't affixed to anything and of course loose tables and chairs in which case there's nothing built but you still have to go through the entitlement process so you're gonna describe what that is and then you're going to go into the approval process and um, from the day it's submitted to the day it's approved assuming that it will be approved usually about 90 days can be done in 60 days often happens in 120 days if you're anywhere near somebody who might complain could take forever possibly could not be approved at all so 
Um, that's all not good news, but generally speaking, if you're in a retail shopping center and you want to add outdoor eating, most of the time it's going to be approved. There's a pretty high success rate. So once you have that entitlement, then um, you're good to set up your tables and all that, right? Mm, not necessarily. So um, what they're doing now, and again, in some cases I've seen this uh, table set up without that approval, but more recently it seems that all the building departments have caught on to this now, that uh, in um, early 2020 when a lot of restaurants were going to go out of business if they didn't have outdoor eating or some way to serve customers outdoors, they were just allowing it and people would set up tables. But later on the uh, building department got more hold of it and they realized that your need for restrooms is calculated based on how many uh, seats you have. And so if you're adding seats uh, outdoors, then the number of restrooms you have more than likely will be, or we'll say optimistically could be, may or may not be, enough. So if you don't have enough restrooms to cover the number of tables and chairs you're adding, then you have to build more restrooms or something else. I have heard of one restaurant that was allowed to assert that they're basically closing the indoor dining room and opening the outdoor dining room and so they skirted the issue that way. On new restaurants um, they're asking us to calculate both the indoor and the outdoor number of seats to make sure that there are enough restrooms and so if you're thinking of running a restaurant with uh, one toilet restroom for men, uh, one toilet restroom for women, or two separate bathrooms, toilet rooms that have a sink and a toilet in each of them for either gender. That's probably not going to be enough unless you go through a process of calculating to find out how many uh, tables and chairs can you have versus how many bathrooms you have. Um, there, uh, it's pretty complicated and there are different intensities of um, how highly utilized it will be based on um, the bureaucrats that are reviewing uh, in the planning and zoning process and at the building department. But let us say um, the assumption seems to be for outdoor eating you're going to have a high density situation. And for indoor eating, depending on how you're set up, um, medium and then the third option is fixed seating. So if you have fixed seating um, then uh, the tables have to be attached to the floor, probably the chairs have to be attached to the floor and if you're like me before I was an architect you may have wondered like why does uh, some of the big franchises why do they bolt all the tables and chairs to the floor? Is that so that somebody can't throw one or what have you? No, it's not. It, it's because um, it reduces, well, there are other reasons, but it reduces the number of people that are counted per number of restrooms. So it enables them to build a bigger restaurant with the same number of uh, toilets as they would have for a smaller restaurant. And um, so this is the difference between non-fixed seating, high density, non-fixed seating, seating, medium density, and fixed seating. And so each is calculated at different rates. And if you're a fixed seating restaurant, then you literally just count the seats and that's how many people you got. So um, when we're designing these things, we run through a little spreadsheet, do a little calculation on it, can tell you the answer. So if you want to add um, outdoor eating to your existing restaurant, a good way to begin is count your restrooms, count your theoretical number of people in the restaurant based on uh, the, the density and fixed seating or not, and then that'll tell you how many additional people you can add with outdoor eating. And then that can tell you, you know, whether it's worth it or not. If you're basically full up as it is, then it won't work for you. If you could add, let us say, 10 seats, is that enough to make it worth going through the process? If you can add 20, you know, and so on, based on the numbers. So um, 
we do um, a little analysis to figure out what you can get without any e exemptions or waivers from the rules. And then you can ask for waivers or exemptions of the rules, but um, depending on which jurisdiction you're in, um, some jurisdictions don't think they have any authority to waive the rules, and so um, then you're, you're stuck. You have to do whatever the rules say. Um, adding to the confusion in this situation is that um, the code is written so that you have one restroom for each gender, but they have been allowing us for many years to identify two restrooms that could be for either gender as long as they're a toilet and a sink in the restroom, or sometimes they'll allow a unisex restroom on the public side and a unisex restroom on the kitchen side. And then you have the issue of um, family restrooms. So if you go to uh, some of the big home centers, they might have a three or four stall men's uh, toilet and a three or four stall uh, women's and then they have a uh, one holer which is called a family restroom and so there's some gray area in there in the calculation and there may be some possibility of having three unisex restrooms again they're isolated from each other so just one person uses each one at a time to avoid having to do much larger bathrooms which would be like a, a bathroom where you go into the bathroom and you see two stalls and possibly a urinal and two sinks that could be used by multiple users at the same time. And um, so we don't know uh, from one jurisdiction and one submission to the next if they're going to buy into that, but that's a possibility for you to think about. So now jumping back into what if we're going into one of these large complexes and the number of restrooms that we need and all that. Um, there are some centers that are designed to have restrooms that are not directly associated with uh, individual tenant improvements. So say you're in one of these uh, shopping centers that's designed to look like a old fashioned downtown and um, you go into a very small shop and you ask to use the restroom and they say they don't have one. Well, the reason why they're able to not have one is, or obviously these carts that they serve, um, sell things from, is because there are um, restrooms that are shared among all the tenants. You also see this in inside casinos, in their shopping centers and things like that. Um, so it's possible that um, you might be able to utilize uh, a portion of the shared community restrooms for whatever your overflow is. So let us say your uh, restaurant with the outdoor eating calculates for 155 users and then um, the uh, plumbing code is looking for 75 men and 75 women to do two one holer restrooms and you're just a little bit over then the developer um, may be able to include your overflow in their um, community restrooms it depends on how they calculated how they figured it and all that and um, that again is a moving target um, those kind of restroom counts tend to be absorbed by whoever can absorb them when they come first and then those that come later the utilization is all utilized in the calculations so there's no ability to gain the use of that in your calcs this is all the kind of how much rain falls from the sky type uh, calculation process but the building codes are pretty specific about how to calculate how many people per square foot. And so there are so many people per square foot in your kitchen, so many square people per square foot in your storage area, your walk-in cooler, what have you, and so many square people per square foot in your dining area, your banquet rooms, your outdoor eating areas. And so this is why I can't tell you this is how big your tenant improvement can be based on two restrooms because 
but depends on all the other rooms and how it all divides up. So um, you can take a look at that and read the plumbing code for yourself. It's pretty simple once you just sit down and um, they do uh, you know on a piece of paper and a spreadsheet calc it all out and see where you're at but you want to do a little what if what if uh, analysis to figure out um, how much you can add of outdoor eating and then um, jumping back a minute to the building permits portion so say you're allowed to do outdoor eating and you're not going to build anything to do this. Can that trigger building permit requires requirements anyway? And the answer is yes, it can. So um, we did one project where um, the internal fire exiting was going through a door that went to the outdoor eating area. And so the building department um, uh, had us reanalyze the fire exiting on the interior restaurant and then um, they ended up having to change some fire exit signs on the inside of the restaurant to accommodate that and we had to submit a uh, fire exiting plan for the existing restaurant even though the uh, restaurant owner had no intention of building anything without this. So uh, it was a whole other process that they had to go through. And um, it's not, again, a super big deal um, as long as you can see it coming. And um, it can be done concurrently with the entitlement process. So if you're going through this between 60 and 120 day entitlement process to get the outdoor eating allowed, um, then you can uh, get a good sense of it looks like this is gonna eventually pass and tell your architect, hey, um, just do a reanalysis of the interior fire exiting because we might not be able to go out through the, um, the outdoor eating area and um, then figure out if I have to do any changes to the fire exit signs or anything like that to make it work. And then that can be uh, getting reviewed by the building department while you're um, in the entitlement process. So um, like a lot of things in the Las Vegas area, Las Vegas is seen as being pretty business friendly uh, in comparison to some places you may come from, Austin, Texas, uh, some cities in California. But on the other hand, if you came from um, more rural places, less highly regulated places, uh, a lot of places in Arizona and Utah, then this is seen as being uh, extremely imposing on a small business that is having to go through this process. And uh, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, we're not advocates for it. Most of the time we're the ones that are in charge of providing the bad news to our client about uh, this delay, that delay, or this is the process that you have to wait for to get approved. But again, um, it's the cost of doing business in Vegas and your competitors have to go through the same thing. So it's an, at least an even playing field for the most part. Um, complications, what are the complications in this process? Um, serving alcohol and gambling. So, um, if your uh, restaurant has gambling or alcohol, then, then this will be a consideration and will it be allowed outdoors along with the outdoor eating? And I would tend to say on the side of gambling, almost definitely not. And on the side of alcohol, possibly. Um, again, depending on a lot of factors, um, how close you are to single family residences, um, where are you? Um, in the downtown downtown Las Vegas it's a foregone conclusion in my mind that you'll be approved almost all the ones I've heard of have been for serving alcohol with a meal outside but as you get further out less likely so um, other complications um, uh, when you get into other counties outside Clark County the rules are going to be completely different and in some of the more rural places in Clark County, you still have the same rules, but the enforcement process is a little different. So um, 
again, watch my entitlement video about this, but in the expectation is in the entitlement video that you first go to the town board, well, first go to the bureaucracy, then to the town board, then to the bureaucracy, then to the planning commission, then to the bureaucracy, then to the county commission or the city council. And um, so uh, some places don't have a, a town board and um, it's possible for the bureaucracy to um, take it upon themselves to allow you to go through a strictly administrative non-public hearing process to allow this and um, that can happen um, it happens often in the city um, especially in areas where the city's trying to encourage development or tourist areas so they could just say um, let it through in a couple weeks process um, talking a little bit about uh, submission for a minute I'm going to do a separate video on submission process but um, from the point at which the uh, submission is accepted is when these timelines begin that I'm mentioning and so it used to be that we would uh, draw and then physically take uh, plans down to whoever some government agency and submit them now they have this intake process where they don't take it in and so um, when they officially intake it is when the dates start so from the first question is how long does it take to draw it and the second question is how long does it take for them to intake it and then the third question is after the intake it how long does it take for the approval and um, so those are all three different questions that depend on the jurisdiction and what it is you're trying to do. Um, nothing gets drawn immediately because it's sort of an investigative process and a decision-making process on the part of the client. You may think you know what you need to begin with, but like I talked about, the calculations and all that will involve a little bit of back and forth between you and your architect. Um, what if you don't want to use an architect for this? And that's quite common also. Uh, if you feel that your situation is contentious, then I would recommend an attorney. Um, there are at least three attorneys that I know of that are uh, well known for uh, being experts in this kind of situation, uh, planning and zoning entitlements and um, just your regular business attorney probably won't know anything about it it's not helpful in my experience to bring them in they're just going to ask the architect what to do and they're probably better public speakers but as far as being able to argue the technical technicalities or being politically connected usually not helpful um, the attorneys that uh, do this kind of processing uh, tend to be a little bit more costly than your um, usual family attorney or business attorney and that's because in my opinion they're making uh, campaign donations to the uh, politicians that are in the decision-making capacities here and um, yes it can help you bet uh, and um, so if you're in a contentious situation um, we've even recommended um, in the middle of going through the process to bring an attorney on board to have them um, help the client because it is political. But um, we have a pretty high success rate in getting these things done and typically it's not needed. Um, again, if you um, watch our entitlement video, I'll talk a little bit more about how all that works, but uh, it's a process. So should you do it? Um, I would say probably yes. Uh, the likelihood is uh, that we'll have more of these mask lockdowns and things and that people will eat outside or prefer to eat outside more. And obviously, if you see your indoor restaurant is full, then there'll be a certain percentage of the public that's always willing to eat outside. So should help you, you'll recover your investment on it. Um, just remember, it can't be done in a hurry. Um, these hearings, they uh, are on a schedule that the government creates. It has nothing to do with your project. They'll hear many projects or many submissions on lots of different topics each time a hearing occurs. And they're at fixed intervals, so there's no way to rush it up. And then when you submit to the building department, the building department here in 
any of the jurisdictions is not uh, rapid by any stretch of or by any comparison uh, with uh, other places that I've done work recently and so that also takes time and um, there is a b ability to expedite it um, and we do expediting uh, on that if you request it we'll we offer expediting um, but um, there's no substitute for allowing enough time to do what it is you need to do, so get started on it as early as you can. Um, if you're going to uh, need to get in your restaurant, but you don't need to get your outdoor eating area until whatever summer comes or prior to the next mask lockdown, which you don't know when it is, you can go ahead and get your whole restaurant approved and then um, submit for the entitlements on the outdoor eating, having pre-calculated your restrooms on that. But it's not guaranteed that they will approve it, so you are taking a risk there. Um, but uh, it's a business risk, a calculated risk, and if you see a uh, neighboring restaurant has outdoor eating, and the likelihood is you'll be able to get approved on it too. So that's it for now for outdoor eating. My name is Ken Small, and I'm with SSA Architecture in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, if you decide that you need assistance with entitlements or permits for your restaurant, um, please consider us. I have a lot of other videos on topics related to uh, architecture, construction, restaurants, uh, things of that nature. So um, please like and share this video and um, do me a favor and um, log in while you're watching my other videos and like and share them too. Thanks a lot. My name is Ken Small with SSA Architecture.